Qin Shi Huangdi was born in 259 BCE in Handan, the capital of the Zhao Kingdom. The future Emperor Qin grew up during the Warring States period. China was divided into seven Warring States, the Qin Kingdom itself lagging behind in development compared to neighboring states, the Zhao Kingdom gaining military strength, the Wei Kingdom the mightiest state attempting to create an empire through expansion, the Chu Kingdom which occupied more than a third of the realm and exerted significant influence on surrounding states. The Qi Kingdom, one of the most powerful states, constantly at war with its neighbors, and the Han Kingdom, the smallest of the seven states. The birth and origin of Qin Shi Huangdi are shrouded in mystery. According to legend, a wealthy merchant named Lu Bu Wei befriended a prince of the Qin Kingdom. During one of their encounters, the prince fell in love with the merchant's pregnant wife, the beautiful wife of the merchant, Zhao Ji, entered into a relationship with the prince and later gave birth to a child for the merchant in 259 BC. The child, born in Handan, was named Ying Zheng, the first name of Qin Shi Huangdi. The prince believed the child to be his own. The prince and Shi Huangdi's father, Zhuangxiang Wang, ascended the throne on September 15, 250 BC and appointed the merchant Lu Bu Wei as prime minister with his son Shi Huangdi as heir to the throne. Zhuangxiang Wang ruled for less than three years and died in 247 BC at the age of 35. His death was likely connected to the former merchant Lu Bu Wei who continued his relationship with Shi Huangdi's mother, who became the queen. After the death of his father, Qin Shi Huangdi ascended to the throne at the tender age of 13. The prime minister, Lu Buwei, also became his guardian and regent ruler of the Qin kingdom. Lu Buwei openly cohabited with Shi Huangdi's mother, a eunuch named Lao Ai, purportedly a eunuch but rumored to have relations with Shi Huangdi's mother, was presented to her as a gift with documents of his castration allegedly forged for bribes. Exploiting his position, Lao Ai amassed significant power while the ruler was still young. However, this did not last long. In 238 BC, when Shi Huangdi turned 18, he decided to take matters into his own hands. He was also informed that his mother had secretly given birth to two children, one of whom was being groomed as a future ruler, and that Lao Ai was amassing troops to attack the palace. Shi Huangdi did not hesitate. He immediately ordered his advisors to gather troops urgently and confront Lao Ai. For attempting rebellion against the crown, Lao Ai, his relatives and accomplices were executed, while Lu Bu Wei was sent into exile but he took his own life on the way. Shi Huangdi expelled his own mother, but later his advisors advised him to bring her back to the palace. The prime minister became Li Si, a disciple of Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu was a great Chinese military strategist and the author of the treatise on military strategy, The Art of War, known worldwide. The Art of War is a systematic guide to strategy and tactics for rulers and commanders. Li Si, a disciple of Sun Tzu, exerted a significant influence on the young ruler. He was determined and ruthless. Li Si proposed to ban all schools and burn all political books, punishing with the death penalty those who kept them. Confucianists were harshly persecuted. In 214 BC, all works of Confucius were destroyed, and a mass burning of books was organized. It is believed that it was the talented Li Si who influenced the policies of the Qin Kingdom, advocating for total war with neighbors and the establishment of Shi Huangdi as the first emperor of a unified China. Let's talk about the preconditions for war economic growth and the development of iron metallurgy allowed the Chinese kingdoms to maintain larger and better equipped armies 
and engage in regular warfare. In the 4th century BCE, the Qin Kingdom lagged behind in military power compared to other warring states. To overcome this dangerous situation for the state, the Shanyan Plan was introduced, aimed at centralizing management, increasing grain production, and enhancing the state's military power. All other activities that distracted the people from this goal, entertainment, trade, the study of sciences, music, etc., were declared parasitic, contributing to the weakening or even the demise of the state and were effectively subject to persecution. As a result of the Lai revolutionary movement, all privileges of the Qin noble aristocracy were abolished and power in Qin passed to the bureaucratic bureaucracy. It was declared that nobility in Qin would henceforth depend not on lineage, but solely on the personal merits of each individual in the service of the Qin state, even if they were from another kingdom. The efficiency of the Qin state's governmental and military system became significantly higher than that of neighboring principalities, where the majority of governmental and military positions were still held by members of the hereditary aristocracy. After the reforms of Shanyan, Qin's policy towards neighboring principalities underwent a complete transformation and became extremely aggressive. This was not coincidental. Qin's new state doctrine explicitly mandated the constant use of the army in offensive warfare against any neighboring principality. Everything was moving towards the unification of China under the Qin dynasty. The active phase began a few years later, after the future Emperor Qin Shi Huang ascended the throne of the already powerful Qin Kingdom. It all began with the conquest of the Han Kingdom. The Han Kingdom was the weakest among the seven leading kingdoms of China at the end of the Warring States period. The Qin Kingdom relentlessly attacked it, seizing one piece of territory after another. Geographically, the Han Kingdom had no access to the sea and was surrounded by kingdoms much more powerful militarily than itself. Unable to resist the Qin Kingdom on the battlefield and seeking to divert its aggression, the ruler of Han devised a clever strategic move. He sent an engineer hydrologist to Qin with a project to build a Grand Canal over 150 kilometers long. The Han ruler, Huan Hui Wang, hoped that the construction of such a canal would require a significant amount of resources and labor, distracting the Qin from their eastward campaigns. However, completed in 247 BCE, the canal helped irrigate vast areas of land and ultimately strengthened the Qin rather than weakening them. This canal, named after the engineer Zhang Guo, still exists today. Constant defeats and foreign policy failures led to the gradual decline of the state and its eventual capture by the Qin Kingdom in 230 BCE. The next target was the Zhao Kingdom, a war with which became the bloodiest of all. At that time, Zhao was one of the few kingdoms capable of standing up to Qin on equal terms. However, even before Shi Huangdi in 260 BCE, Zhao suffered a devastating defeat in the Battle of Changping, losing 450,000 soldiers. Natural disasters struck Zhao, including an earthquake and severe drought, leading to famine. Exploiting these circumstances, Qin dispatched three armies against Zhao in 229 BCE. Since Qin's forces had a significant advantage in open field battles, the Zhao general Li Mu sheltered his troops behind formidable fortifications. Qin incurred heavy losses in attacks on Zhao's defenses, and Li Mu was reluctant to engage in open combat. Then, Qin decided to resort to trickery, bribing one of the ministers of the Zhao kingdom with a large amount of gold to blacken the reputation of the talented general Li Mu Li Mu was accused of conspiracy with Qin and executed, after which the Zhao army collapsed in battle. In 228 BCE, Qin's forces finally captured Zhao, taking its ruler, 
Qian captive. Only after Qin defeated Zhao, its strongest opponent, did the Yan Kingdom suddenly realize that what was happening went far beyond the usual wars between kingdoms and that it itself could easily become the next victim of Qin's aggression. Not relying on military force, Dan, the heir to the throne of Yan, sent Jin Kei under the guise of an envoy to assassinate the Qin ruler. However, this attempt, the most famous in the history of China, failed. The Qin ruler not only survived, but also received a perfect pretext to start a war with Yan under the pretext of revenge for the assassination attempt. In 226 BCE, Qin's forces attacked Yan. The defeated Yan army retreated to Liaodun, where on the Yan River, Dan, the heir to the throne, was killed by his own father's order, who hoped to preserve the state at such a price, and his head was handed over to the Qin. After this, Qin left Yan alone for several years, but in 222 BCE, it annexed its remnants. Wei Kingdom suffered from attacks from the state of Qin even before the reign of Shi Huangdi, facing defeat after defeat and losing territory. It even had to move its capital to Dalian to get away from the Qin border. The constant attacks from Qin led to the creation of a defensive alliance between Wei and Han, but this alliance proved ineffective due to mistrust and poor coordination between the allies. In 225 BCE, the Qin general Wang Ben led a huge army of 600,000 soldiers to besiege the Wei capital. The city of Dalian, situated between two rivers and surrounded by numerous canals, had formidable natural defenses. Realizing that a direct assault on the capital would be difficult, Wang Ben decided to flood the city by diverting water from the Yellow River. Qin forces spent three months digging canals to channel water to Dalian. When they succeeded, the city was flooded, its walls collapsed, and the last ruler of Wei, Jia Wan, surrendered. Thus, the state of Wei was absorbed and its territory annexed by Qin. Once, Chu was the largest and most powerful state in China. Even before the reign of Shi Huangdi, Qin rulers bribed officials of Chu to undermine its alliance with other states and eliminate the possibility of forming a broad coalition against the Qin principality. By isolating Chu from other states, Qin was able to inflict several major defeats and seize a significant portion of Chu's territory, including its capital Ying, in 278 BCE. Afterward, Qin left Chu alone for half a century, but Shi Huangdi was building an empire and did not leave any chance for the separate existence of the Chu state. Shi Huangdi appointed the young and ambitious general Li Xin as the commander for the decisive offensive against Chu, intending to conquer this vast principality that occupied a third of the realm, with only 200,000 soldiers. General Wang Jian, believing that it would require at least 600,000 soldiers for this task, was retired as an old and cowardly commander, despite all his previous merits. In 224 BCE, Qin troops under the leadership of Li Xin and Meng Tian invaded Chu, but suffered a major defeat. Then, the Qin ruler acknowledged the mistake and personally asked Wang Jian to return to service and lead the conquest of Chu, providing him with the required 600,000 soldiers. In the Battle of Qinan, the Chu army was defeated. In 223 BCE, Qin forces captured the capital of Chu and captured the Chu ruler. The state of Qi, one of the most powerful warring states, hoped for friendly relations with Qin and did not participate in various coalitions against Qin. The state of Qi did not come to the aid of the state of Zhao in its difficult times, despite urgent requests. However, it was not the ruler of Qi's hopes for good relations with Qin that were justified, but Qin's calculations for the defeat of principalities individually, 
after the destruction of all other principalities in 221 BCE, the victorious Qin army attacked Qi. The ruler, Zhang Wan, was completely unprepared for such a turn of events, and he had no allies to turn to for help, as all other states had already been captured by the Qin. When the Qin troops approached the capital, not knowing what to do, Jiang Wan surrendered without a fight and was placed under the guard of Qin troops among the pines and cypresses in the palace park, where he died of starvation. The state of Qi was liquidated and its territory was annexed to Qin. Thus emerged the first centralized empire in the territory of China. At the age of 39, in 221 BCE, Ying Zheng assumed the title Emperor Huangdi, receiving the well-known name Qin Shi Huangdi. Qin Shi Huangdi literally means the first emperor of the Qin dynasty. The capital of the empire was chosen to be Xianyang, located in the ancestral Qin territories, not far from modern-day Xi'an. Upon the advice of Li Si, the emperor refrained from appointing his relatives and friends as princes of the new lands to avoid the disintegration of the state. From the confiscated weapons, twelve bronze statues were also cast, which were erected in the capital. Several measures were introduced, including a unified road network, a standardized monetary system, standardized writing characters, hieroglyphs, and a common system of weights and measures. These measures laid the foundation for the cultural and economic unity of China to this day. Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi utilized the labor of millions of people for grand constructions. Construction was a heavy burden on the population. Immediately after declaring himself emperor, he began building his tomb, the Terracotta Army. The underground army consisted of terracotta statues, a type of unglazed ceramic, which, according to Shi Huangdi's intentions, were supposed to accompany him after death, presumably allowing him to satisfy his authoritarian ambitions in the afterlife. The construction required the efforts of over 700,000 laborers and craftsmen and lasted for 38 years, with the burial wall perimeter spanning six kilometers. The warrior figures are genuine works of art as they were crafted individually by hand using various techniques. Each statue has its own unique features and even facial expressions. Around 8,000 sculptures of infantrymen, archers, and cavalrymen were buried underground, and after the emperor's death, a vast amount of treasures and craftsmen's works were buried with him. Additionally, 48 of his concubines were buried alive with the emperor. The statues were discovered in March 1974. The first phase of excavation took place from 1978 to 1984, and the second from 1985 to 1986. The third phase began on June 13, 2009. In 1987, during the 11th session of UNESCO, the Terracotta Army was included in the World Heritage List. The tomb complex of Qin Shi Huangdi was one of the first sites in China to be included in this list. Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi built a network of roads spanning the entire country with three lanes, the central lane reserved for the emperor's chariot. The Empire of Qin had nearly 7,000 kilometers of paved roads. Given the diverse landscape of China, the construction of stone bridges and retaining structures was required. The transportation system was equipped with relay stations where couriers could change tired horses for fresh ones, as well as rest stops where travelers could eat and spend the night. As a symbol of unification, a portion of the Great Wall of China that separated the former kingdoms was demolished. Only the northern part of these walls was preserved. Its individual sections were fortified and connected. Thus, the newly formed Great Wall of China separated China from the barbarians. The construction lasted for 10 years, and the total number of workers involved during the Qin period reached, according to some estimates, 
two million. Slaves, soldiers and peasants were enlisted for construction. As a result of epidemics and grueling labor, tens of thousands of people perished. The outrage over the conscription for the wall's construction sparked popular uprisings and served as one of the reasons for the downfall of the Qin dynasty. Another remarkable construction was the Linzi Canal, 36 kilometers long, connecting the Xianjian River with the Li River. The canal facilitated river transportation across vast territories in southern China. The emperor chose not to live in the central palace of the capital and instead began constructing the enormous Yipang Palace. Yipang was the name of the emperor's favorite concubine. Construction on the palace began in 212 BCE, involving several hundred thousand people, and the palace housed countless treasures and numerous concubines. But the palace was completed only after the emperor's death. During the last 10 years of his life, the emperor rarely stayed in his capital. He constantly inspected various corners of his empire, making sacrifices at local temples, informing local deities of his achievements, and erecting steles, praising himself. These trips were accompanied by intense road construction, the building of palaces, and temples for sacrifices. Starting from 220 BCE, the emperor undertook five major inspection tours throughout the country, covering distances of thousands of kilometers. He was accompanied by several hundred soldiers and numerous servants. To confuse potential enemies, he sent several different carriages throughout the country, while he himself remained hidden behind curtains, and even the soldiers did not know whether the emperor was with them or not. The emperor was most concerned about the impending death. During his travels, he met with magicians and sorcerers, hoping to learn the secret of the elixir of immortality. In 219 BCE, he sent an expedition in search of it to the islands of the Eastern Sea, and there were several such expeditions. Confucian scholars saw the pursuit of immortality as empty superstition, for which they paid a cruel price. According to legend, the emperor ordered 460 of them to be buried alive. In 213 BCE, Li Si persuaded the emperor to burn all the books. The emperor was convinced that the ideas contained in the books posed a threat to his plan for a new social order, the creation of a universal Chinese state. In the last years of his life, disappointed in achieving immortality, Qin Shi Huang traveled less and less beyond the borders of his empire, shutting himself off from the world in his vast palace complex. Avoiding contact with mortals, the emperor hoped to be seen as a deity. Instead, the totalitarian rule of the first emperor led to a growing number of dissatisfied people each year. Uncovering three conspiracies, the emperor had no reason to trust any of his confidants. The death of Qin Shi Huang occurred during a trip through the country, during which his heir, Hu Hai, accompanied him along with the chief eunuch of the chancellery, Zhao Gao, and the chief advisor, Li Si. The date of death is considered to be September 10th, 210 BCE, in the palace in Shakyu, two months' journey from the capital. He died from taking pills of immortality containing mercury. The heir to the throne, Hu Hai, who took the throne name Qin Ershi Huandi, nevertheless proved to be an incompetent ruler. Supporters of the previous dynasties immediately rushed into a struggle for the division of imperial inheritance and in 206 BCE, the entire family of Qin Shi Huang was exterminated. <laughs>